And we're live. All right, guys, we've got a special show for you today. We are going to be discussing what is proof of stake for Ethereum. Hopefully, uh, our special guest, Rick Dudley, will be explaining that so understand it. But, but first, his bio. Rick Dudley is an opinionated and passionate developer. He works very closely with Vlad Zamir. Zemmerfer on implementing Casper in Ethereum and is a leading member of Koala organization as a founder and CEO of the startup Vulcanize. Uh, Rick, welcome to the show. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for joining us. So, so as the title states, uh, we're going to be talking uh, proof of stake. So why don't we kind of dive in and uh, maybe you can give us the bird's eye explanation of how Ethereum uh, wants to implement its version of proof of stake. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Casper is uh, the working title. I'm pretty sure it'll be the production title for um, the Ethereum uh, proof of stake uh, protocol. Um, what it does is it is it provides um, a set of uh, basically, you know, the the validators uh, create a set of um, justifications or a set of like bets on which block they think is going to be. Um, the next block, um, and then they provide a bunch of justifications for why they think that block is going to be the next block. Um, and then in that process, uh, um, the justifications are, you know, basically um, irreversible. So, so when a validator says that this block is going to be the next block, they provide a set of justifications that shouldn't be, that should never be reversed, basically. So like as so sort of like the the main property is that it's a monotonically increasing set of confirmations, and if the confirmations ever go down, that's because a validator uh, equivocated and they can be detected. Um, so that's sort of the those are sort of the main differences I think between and then and then the other thing is sort of that uh, you can get uh, there. There's an interest uh, in the Casper community for. Uh, in most Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms, we kind of group all the Byzantine faults together. Um, and with Casper, the the exercise is in separating out those Byzantine faults and then taking different actions uh, based on the different types of faults that there are. So uh, from that, you can also sort of get better um, guarantees about performance, even if you're under like a 51% attack or some of these other states that normally uh, a proof of stake algorithm wouldn't operate under. Can we dive a little bit, because I'm kind of confused myself, but can you explain a little bit more on the whole concept around sharding? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple different sharding proposals, and I mean, there's a lot of work going on in on sharding, but conceptually, uh, it's just it's just you, you have one blockchain that sort of has, uh, that's sort of like the, the primary chain, and then um, as uh, in the Casper model or in the proposed future Ethereum sharding model, which doesn't really have a name, uh, as the, 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 the network will dynamically uh, create sub like networks, they'll create, you know, like if you have five validators, two of them will split off and they'll maintain consensus amongst each other and then periodically publish that consensus uh, to the larger network. Um, so it's very similar to um, sort of more traditional scaling solutions that you see just in databases. I mean, so in, in traditional databases, you have a concept of a database shard concept um, where each individual shard is smaller than the total parent network. They have information that's local to them. Uh, some of the challenges are uh, availability. So, I mean, that's kind of the big challenge. I mean, since we're being brief, I'll just mention this one, which is, um, you know, I'm on a shard. Uh, I tell the parent node available via by by committing a hash to the blockchain. Um, when that data is unavailable, and why is it unavailable, and how do we punish people for data not being available? How do we make the data available across shards? There's a lot of questions around, um, in particular, data availability um, across uh, shards. Interesting. So does that when that new protocol does it affect how EVM is currently structured? Absol absolutely, yeah. So it, it depends on um, 
It depends exactly on what we're talking about, but so so you can imagine that you could, I mean, you can change the consensus algorithm and not change the EVM, but if you're talking about sharding, then you probably need some sort of model for namespaces, right? You need you need a way for an application or a, a transaction to know which validators, like a, a user has to know which set of validators to send a transaction to, um, and and usually, that means you need some sort of way of routing and naming, you know, routing messages between the shards and then naming and identifying the shards and then also figuring out which application is running on which shard. Um, hmm. So how uh, how uh, how far are you guys on deciding what type of protocol you guys will pick for the sharding uh, uh, system? Well, I don't. Uh, I don't. I know that Vitalik's been making a lot of progress on that lately. Um, his progress is right now. Um, it's definitely a top-down approach where um, consensus. Everyone sort of figures out uh, which applications go on which shards. Validators don't really know which shard they're on until they're on it. Um, there's some other desirable properties, but I think again, let's. Just for the sake of brevity, can we uh, can you talk a little bit more about the staking itself? So, I assume there's a minimum of ether you have to stake to become a node. Yeah, again, uh, Vitalik has numbers in mind. I don't; um, okay. they're pretty big numbers. Okay. And obviously, you have to like tune it and figure it out. So yeah, so so to become a bonded validator what you have to do is you have to register uh, so you know there's going to be like a new genesis block for the proof of stake system that's going to be published to the proof of work system in parallel for some period of time and then um, you know as validate as validators uh, bond with that new contract obviously get locked up in that contract and then and then they they can they can start participating in, in consensus, and then when they fail to participate in consensus, um, part of that bond gets slashed. And if they equivocate, so then for a little, so then for a little bit of time, it's going to be a hybrid version of POS with proof of uh, with proof of work. Yeah, but it's not going to be. It's more like two parallel chains, where okay. one is reading the state from the other. Um, so like for so so basically. The proof of stake network will be reading state from the proof of work network, but the proof of work network probably won't be reading state from the proof of stake network. Okay. So that eventually you can turn off the proof of work network and have all the state from that network into in the proof of stake network uh, that's already running. And then you guys are first launching this on testnet before mainnet. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, there's going to be several testnets. There's going to be more than one. So, like, during your research and during your uh, discovery mode over here, what would you say is the biggest hurdles for, let's say, making this proof of stake system actually work? Oh, so there's two. There's two major problems. One is um, how do you have a, a consensus algorithm of this type uh, resistant to griefing attacks? I think that's a major issue. Um, you know, um, and how do you make it? And then related to that is censorship resistance. How do you make it censorship resistant and have the strong censorship resistance guarantees that um, the Ethereum community, you know, Vlad and Vitalik, you know, kind of spearheading uh, desire. Um, so that's that's a big that's a big challenge. Um, and then sort of the parallelism, composability, uh, multi-threading. Uh, stuff is a really big issue. So, the the existing EVM, the existing Ethereum network is effectively single threaded. Um, it does everything sequentially in order, and everything is it, and it, you need to do that in order to have a, a single ordering of the transactions in the blocks. Um, but when you but that doesn't scale. Um, so mm. what you want to do is you want to have multiple threads of processing happening in parallel, and you want to be able to know. Um, at compile time, actually, how to separate out those processes. So you want to be able to say, "Oh, these two these two DApps never talk to each other, so they can be on two very they can be on two shards that are very far away." Whereas if you have two apps that talk a lot to each other, maybe they need to be on the same shard, 
And then if you have some apps that like sort of talk often but not all the time, maybe they need to be um, on closer shards. Um, and so figuring out how to do all that multi-threading, figuring out all of the logic behind that is, is another obviously like like pretty big challenge and a pretty big shift from uh, what the EVM does today. How many people are currently working? Like you, you Vlad, uh, Vitalik. How many others are working on this? I'm I'm very part time. Uh, okay. Vlad and Vitalik are very full time. I mean, they're more they're way more than full time. Uh, Greg Meredith uh, works uh, contributes. Uh, he has a team of people who contribute. Um, Carl, um, whose last name is escaping me. Um, he, he works on it full time as well, uh, implementing Casper in the Pi Ethereum um, code base. So you can you can go to the uh, so if you go to the Ethereum GitHub, I'm pretty sure you can find his work there. Um, okay. And I think there's probably two or three other people uh, that I'm that you know come in and contribute. A lot a lot of the contributions are kind of um, you know it's kind of part time stuff uh, because you know people. Are, you know, they're, it's volunteer stuff. So, um, but I think those are kind of like the main, I don't think I'm leaving out any main contributors. Apologies to whomever I'm forgetting. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's fine. Uh, let me ask you this. What would you say are you, I'm going to play a little bit devil's advocate over here, but what would you say are the main skeptics um, attack, I want to say attack, but worry about this proof of stake? What's their main about going forward? Yeah, the main issue that people have is the problems that were solved years ago in proof of stake. So the the term I think is sort of saddled with uh, early implementations that simply didn't work, um, okay. and so they were they were susceptible to nothing at stake attacks and long range attacks. Um, both mm -hmm. of those issues are resolved pretty easily with um, with just you know uh, bonds and uh, and um, yeah, with bombs. So, um, and stake grinding is the third attack. But all these all these attacks are addressed and have been addressed within the community for a number of years. So, so Casper um, has its own solutions um, to those problems. I, when I read people's criticisms of proof of stake. Oh, and I guess the other the, so those are sort of the three illegitimate complaints. And then I think that there's another category of complaint that uh, I did, but is much more legitimate, which is that it's a different security model than proof of work. And um, I'm like, yeah, it's a different security. You know, ultimately, a lot of arguments distill down to that, where people are like, but mm -hmm. this from proof of work, or that from proof of work, or this. And I'm like, yeah, that's all true, but this is a different security model. Apply. Um, and and I and you know I think that you have the option of having higher security with proof of stake. I mean, again, it depends on. It's it's a pretty subjective thing. I actually, I mean, there's there's the facts that you can sort of break down, and and then but then your risk profile is a is a very personal thing. So, so maybe you know you're more comfortable with the risk profile of proof of work than you are with proof of stake, uh, application or community or whatever, but. You know, that's not that doesn't mean that proof of stake doesn't work. Okay. So let's let's talk about this. Let's say it's implemented, let's say it goes live right now this second. It went from testnet mainnet, everything works. Uh, the existing dApps of built on top of Ethereum right now, will they have to change how they had their initial set with Ethereum? Uh, I mean that's a complicated question. I think the short answer is is that is that existing apps will be supported on the new chain. Um, okay, and uh, because it's kind of like a, a hard requirement, right? Like, like, like to try to modify that code um, would be extremely complicated. Um, mm -hmm. Just from an operational perspective, uh, especially in a decentralized context. Um, so I think that the existing code, um, the existing byte code, will run, and I think that we'll take the uh, existing high-level languages. And generate new byte code for uh, new contracts. Cool. And I know you can't really, you couldn't really figure out the timeline, but still on track for Elise starting to implement Casper at the end of the year. 
You mean deploy? I, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of code written. There's a lot yeah. of repos available that people can look at and see, and, and progress is being made. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think whatever the whatever the existing timetable is, there, I think we're probably hitting it or a little bit faster. Um, That's really good to hear. Yeah, I mean, I say a little bit faster. I mean, a very a very little bit faster, right? But but uh, yeah, as as far as I'm I'm concerned, it's it's moving along. Um, quite quickly, well, because when because uh, Vlad's correct by construction model, once you sort of get everything done, it's all done at once, right? It, it, there's not mm -hmm. a lot of incremental steps. Um, there's not a lot of milestones. It's like, oh, here here's the algorithm, and then everything kind of works. So, um, so we're, we're I mean, basically, uh, Vlad just started talking about that a couple days ago. That he he basically got a lot of algorithm, like basically the whole algorithm nailed down at at this point, and then um, they need to uh, implement it, but they've already have a, a partial implementation that'll probably cover, almost certainly will cover the majority of the full implementation. So uh, then, uh, then obviously an enormous amount of testing and an enormous amount of integration uh, occurs uh, after the algorithm is, is solidified. Cool, awesome. Well, I think nope, we'll leave it at nope. that. You know, I just want to thank you for uh, answering all my questions on uh, proof of stake, and hopefully, some people have learned uh, something over here. If people want to get a hold of you, what is the best way to contact you? Uh, Twitter, probably uh, at af dudley zero. Okay. Um, and I'll just type that to awesome. you in this in this thing. So, I'll make sure that goes in the show notes. Yeah, um, that's probably the best way of getting in contact with me. Then the next best way would be email. Um, um, yeah, this isn't really secret. Um, that's probably the next best way of getting in contact with me. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, talking with us, and have a great day, brother. Yeah. Thanks, Amir. Bye. Cheers.